Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And welcome to the final episode of our Skyrim Mysteries Iceberg. Now, I know this isn't the first time I've said those words, as I originally expected Part 3 to be our last entry into this series. But, as it turned out, there's just so much for us to cover that a Round 4 became necessary. So, here we are. Part 4 will consist of the very hefty remainder of Tier 5, which, by nature of being the deepest tier of our iceberg, is filled with the most fascinating and obscure mysteries we've yet to cover. And, as you'll remember, was left unfinished in the previous episode. Not without good reason, though, because we got a lot to do. Anyway, you all know the drill. Pour out a glass of your finest juniper mead, throw a log on the fire, and relax. As we dive into our final episode of the Skyrim Mysteries Iceberg. Seriously, this time. I promise. But first, quick word from today's video sponsor. A couple of years ago, I was involved in a rather serious car accident, which ended up costing me both my beloved Ford Fiesta and my ability to do basic algebra. And boy, if only I had someone like Morgan and Morgan in my corner back then, I might have been able to get one of those things back. Morgan and Morgan is America's largest injury law firm that has the staff and resources to actually fight for your case with all the conveniences of the 21st century. With Morgan and Morgan, you can submit a claim without ever having to leave your couch. With just eight clicks, you can have these guys working for you in the time it takes to order a pizza. And the best part is, they don't take a dime unless they win. That's right, they either get you a W, or it's all free with no risk to you. It's no wonder that over three million people have trusted Morgan & Morgan after their accident injuries. For more information, go to www.forthepeople.com slash theepicnate315 or dial pound law 529 from your cell phone. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Starting off, we have the curious presence of a banner that really doesn't belong. Indeed, inside Castle Volkahar, within Lord Harkin's personal chambers, several interesting objects and ornaments can be found displayed on the Vampire King's walls including ancient swords, the pelts of his slain werewolf enemies, and, oh my, what's this? A banner belonging to the Mythic Dawn. What? The Mythic Dawn were, of course, the Maroons' Dagon-worshipping primary antagonists of the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, where they assassinated Emperor Uriel Septim VII and instigated the Oblivion Crisis before eventually being banished to the pages of history by the hero of Kavach. Suffice to say, as far as we know, the Mythic Dawn has zero relationship with the Volkahar clan, or any vampire organization for that manner. While Harkin's vampires have been agitating for a similar apocalyptic event for most of their history, they specifically seek to blot out the sun and render unto the Mundus an eternal night sky, the two factions should actually be diametrically opposed, as they're worshippers of rival Daedric gods. The Dawn's Maroon's Dagon and the Vampire's Molag Ball are supposed to be ferocious rivals. So, again, we ask, what's the flag doing in this undead fortress? Well, perhaps, like all the werewolf pelts Harkin collects, this flag isn't meant to be seen as a symbol of allegiance, but rather a trophy commemorating a victory over his enemies. Perhaps the Volkahar clan actually battled against the Mythic Dawn during the Oblivion Crisis, which would kinda make them good guys, or good guy adjacent for a short period of time. We know it next to nothing about how the crisis played out in Skyrim, and we know even less about the Volkahar clan's extremely ancient history. So there's room for all sorts of surprises to emerge. 
But for now, the connection between these two antagonists is one of my favorite unexplained bits of lore. Next on our list, what did the Thalmor know about the Labyrinthian Sanctuary? So, in an earlier episode of the Iceberg, we talked a bit about the mystery of the Kanarik Mask and the Broomjinar Sanctuary. Basically, there's this ancient dragon cult city in the Hjalmarch Mountains called Broomjinar, or the Labyrinthian, as it's known on the game map, where we can obtain a uniquely powerful dragon priest mask called Kanarik. If we have all the other vanilla game dragon priest masks in our inventory, we also seem to go back in time. It's weird. Make sure you check out that episode to learn more. Well, now the mystery gets even bigger, as it would seem as though agents of the Thalmor were also aware of this site, and actively planning to use it for their own benefit. You see, upon walking up to the ruins of Ferelhost, an ancient dragon priest lair in the Rift, the player will be approached by a strange High Elf, calling himself Captain Valmir. He will be wearing the armor of whatever faction the Dovahkin has sided with in Skyrim Civil War, or just generic Imperial armor if you've yet to choose. Valmir will urge the player to go inside Ferelhost and retrieve a Dragon Priest mask stored deep inside. Here's how he explains it. You there! As an officer of the Imperial Legion, I require your assistance to complete my mission. The General has sent me to obtain a powerful weapon for the war effort. This was the last great bastion of the Dragon Cult and their leader's mask was reported to be quite powerful. Very good. The research I've done seems to indicate that Scorm Snowstrider left part of his journal here after laying siege. I believe it should indicate how to enter the blocked-off sections of the Stronghold. I should warn you, Foral Host is quite haunted, but I'm sure you can handle it. Return to me here once you've obtained the mask. What are you waiting for? Get in there and find that mask! Indeed, from here, we'll embark on what's pretty much just a standard dungeon crawl, along the way stumbling across the remains of several other soldiers who evidently attempted to fulfill Valmir's orders before we did. Eventually, we'll make our way to the final chamber, slay the dragon priest and take his mask, Regat as it's called. However, when we re-emerge to give the Aldmer his mask, he'll be wearing the opposite Civil War faction's armor, and encouraging another soldier to go in and do the same thing. Clearly, something is up. Valmir is not who he claims to be, and when confronted, he'll immediately turn hostile. Upon slaying him, we'll find a note in his inventory which reads as follows, quote, Valmir, you will proceed to the ruins of Ferelhost to retrieve the mask from the dragon cult there. If you are discovered, impersonate an officer. It is unlikely that anyone from Skyrim will be clever enough to see through the disguise. Once you have obtained the mask, bring it to the Labyrinthian. Hmm. So, someone, or some organization, specifically had ordered this High Elf to recover the mask and return it to that same Broomjinar Sanctuary. Highly implying that whoever these people were, they knew something about the Sanctuary's secret. They had an idea that by bringing all the masks back there, they would get a reward out of it. And they were trying to leverage this secret for themselves. While it officially remains unclear who exactly Valmir was working on behalf of, his High Elven character makes the Thalmor a uniquely strong possibility. I think you could also make a case that the arrogance of this letter is very Thalmor-like as well. It's unlikely that anyone from Skyrim will be clever enough to figure out what we're doing. Like, that's characteristic Aldmeri arrogance. Though, at the same time, we know that the Thalmor themselves have long been skeptical of the existence of dragons in the region, 
as well as Skyrim's Dragon Cult past. So, perhaps they're not the actual driving force. I suppose the real questions are, who was Valmir working for, and what did they hope to accomplish at the Labyrinthian? Coming in at number three, as most of you are probably aware, back in 2017, Bethesda and Zenimax released the Elder Scrolls Legends, a digital collectible card game in the mold of Magic the Gathering in Hearthstone, where players could collect various Tamriel-themed cards and battle against each other for rewards. The game also included a sort of story mode, which revealed and elaborated upon a good amount of the lore. Well, anyway, it didn't take long after the game went live for folks on PC to start rummaging through the game files and dig around in hopes of finding cut content or evidence of an upcoming DLC. For the most part, nothing big came out of this data mining. There were some unused art and audio assets here and there, but nothing particularly noteworthy, especially in terms of lore. Except, however, for this one thing. You see, data miners discovered the following unused art file. Take a look. Indeed, this strange and ultimately cut image depicts what is clearly a greybeard but with strange, glowing, almost vampiric eyes and a sinister expression on his face. Standing before a series of strange gong instruments poorly attached to these basalt pillars, it's very bizarre. The basalt pillars invoke High Hrothgar, but the background seems to depict a much broader dark valley of sorts. It's possible that this could be an allusion to some of Skyrim's earliest concept art, which depicted High Hrothgar in the Throat of the World in a more volcanic environment, but the gongs are much harder to explain. In The Elder Scrolls Online, we learn that Reachmen use these instruments and similar bells to commune with the dead, and they believe they harness some dark powers which may be a clue as to what these greybeards are up to. Judging by the image's file size and dimensions, we can safely say that the developers intended to use it as art for some kind of card that would have been in the game. Though the name of said card and its stats and description are unknown. It's entirely possible this was just the product of an artist having some fun, and hey, it was removed from the game for a reason, right? But it leads us to wonder if perhaps the Greybeards knew something we didn't. For our fourth spot, we ask what are Maven Blackbriar and Lilith Maidenloom up to? So, Lilith Maidenloom is the owner and matriarch of the Whiterun stable just outside the city. While she's clearly the head honcho, the big cheese, if you will, the stable is largely run by her son Skolivar and grandson Yervar. Interestingly though, despite the appearance of a harmless old lady enjoying something resembling a retirement, she appears to maintain strong connections to Skyrim's criminal underworld, specifically to the most powerful woman in Riften. No, not its Jarl. Worse. Take a listen. Do you like horses? You should visit the stables. I own them, you see, and our stock is excellent. My friend Maven and I, have you met Maven in Riften? We know our place in this world, know the place of others, too. Maven, of course, is a woman who needs no introduction. We've discussed her already in this iceberg. Suffice to say, as the head of the Blackbriar crime family, and one of the richest people in Tamriel, she is a very notorious figure indeed. So, what's Lilith doing referring to her as a BFF of sorts? Furthermore, the following exchange can be captured once in a blue moon, between Lilith and Fralia at Whiterun's market. 
Hello, Fralia, dear. Lilith, always a pleasure. Just browsing, or were you looking for something particular? Funny you should ask. I'm in the market for a new locket. Something in polished silver, maybe. Big enough to hold, say, a folded-up letter? Ah, I see. I think I know just what you need. I don't have anything like that here now, but my Yorland. He can make you one right quick. Perfect, my dear. Absolutely perfect. I'll see you then. While this letter could theoretically be going to anyone in Skyrim, given the previous quote, my suspicion is that it's heading over to Maven, especially considering that she's looking to imbue it with jewelry. Clearly, the recipient is important. But why? What is the nature of this oh-so-suspicious friendship? Well, the answer may lie in Skyrim's cut content. I know, more of that, it's wonderful, ain't it? You see, in the game files, there are several unused assets referring to a location that does not appear in the game, called Maiden Loom Manor, which would have been located within the city of Whiterun. Furthermore, both Lilith and her male family members have several unused quest packages and movement markers, which are also dormant. It's likely that the Whiterun Stable's owners were meant to have a much more opulent household, and perhaps more developed storyline during Skyrim's development. One which would have better contextualized their relationship with the Blackbriars, but ultimately they were downgraded to their current humble abode, which consists of no more than a two-bedroom shack beyond the town walls and no story. Oh, and one more thing, not necessarily related to Maven, but Skolvar Sablehilt, Lilith's son and the stable's lead operator, is set to have an extremely negative disposition towards his son Yervar. So much so that if the player unalives Yervar, you'll actually get a letter from his father, thanking you <laughs> for your action and rewarding you with a few septums. This may just be a crude joke by Bethesda, or perhaps another relic of a grander storyline that never was. At number five, this one kind of ties back into that dark graybeard card we mentioned earlier. I'd like to talk about some strange anomalies concerning Jurgen Windcaller. So, Jurgen Windcaller, for those of you who don't know or could use the refresher, is the semi-mythical founder of the Greybeards, who, according to legend, founded the guild and built High Hrothgar sometime in the late First Era, after having an epiphany that convinced him needless violence was bad, actually. The Greybeards speak exceptionally highly of him and his merits as a noble pacifist, and we can even encounter his spirit in Sovngarde, where he seems pretty authentic. However, there's also some stuff about this Jurgen fellow that's a little sus. Early in the game's main quest line, the Greybeards will send us to Jurgen's tomb to recover his ancient prized horn as a sort of initiation ritual. For one, his tomb is located in the very haunted swamps of Hjolmarch on the other side of the map, which is a little odd, but when you arrive at his actual sarcophagus, you'll find that it's inscribed with a Daedric script. What? The Daedric language is used pretty much exclusively by the Daedra themselves and their followers, and sometimes certain Dark Elf communities, but I digress, it has no business being present on a Nordic hero's tomb. When translated, it simply reads Windcaller, which isn't particularly nefarious, but still, why not use Dovazul or some normal English? Very suspicious indeed. Furthermore, if you dig real deep into some of the Windcaller lore, 
there are these weird esoteric illusions that are just vague enough that they can be attributed to coincidence, but it's tricky. For example, the Pocket Guide to the Empire's edition on Skyrim, released back with Morrowind in the early 2000s, if I'm not mistaken, mentions an interesting final battle that Jurgen had to win in order to successfully convince the Nords of his faith. It reads, quote, His victory was sealed in a legendary confrontation, where the calm is said to have swallowed the shouts of seventeen tongues of the militant school for three days, until all his opponents lay exhausted and then became his disciples. Now, swallowing shouts sounds suspiciously like an allusion to absorbing dragon souls. Furthermore, seventeen is the exact number of Daedra known to man in Tamriel, which is odd, but still straddles that line between coincidence and game-changing lore. Additionally, and perhaps most notably, if after recovering Jurgen's horn and taking it to the Greybeards, you decide on your own intuition to bring it back to his sarcophagus and place it down, the Dragonborn will receive a Dragon Soul from it. Which strongly suggests Windcaller shared in the Dragon Blood, despite no sources explicitly stating such a fact. Overall, between his Daedric connections and what I'd consider his more obvious Dovahkin connections, Jurgen Windcaller remains one of the Elder Scrolls universe's most mysterious men. Next on our list, who, or what, was Thaddeus Cosma? Alright, so this one is kinda cheating, as while it's absolutely a Skyrim mystery, it's really from ESO rather than Tez 5. But nonetheless, I think you'll agree it is absolutely deserving a spot in this final tier. So back in early 2020, the Elder Scrolls Online received a major new expansion called Greymoor which opened up the western region of Skyrim and sent players to investigate a series of strange werewolf and vampire attacks. One of the cooler things about Greymoor was that it allowed players to access Blackreach as well. Wait a minute, Nate, I hear you ask. Isn't Blackreach a Dwemer ruin beneath the Pale Hold in eastern Skyrim? Well, yes, but ESO reveals the ruin we explore in the Elder Scrolls V beneath the glaciers was really just a section of a significantly more massive underground tunnel system that linked together several Dwemer cities, kingdoms, and factories. Anyway, within one of these sections of this new Super Black Reach, we can stumble upon a large Dwemer fortress named Nchuthenkarst, with a Dwemer adventurer named Raynor standing outside of it. Raynor will warn the player against entering, explaining that a strange anomaly is taking place within the dungeon, and for whatever reason, a variety of beasts and creatures from all over Tamriel, which have no business being this far underground, are just manifesting within the sealed vault. This will begin the quest, Tones of the Deep, and it's one of the most intriguing the franchise has ever seen. Sure enough, upon entering the vault, we'll witness a variety of strange beasts seemingly teleport in before our eyes. Bears, Spriggans, Bandits, and even Crocodiles and Durzogs will appear out of thin air and engage the player. What's going on here? Well. As we fight our way through these mismatched opponents, we'll eventually get something resembling an answer. Towards the middle of Nchuthenkarst, the player will encounter a bizarrely dressed man named Thaddeus Cosma. And I'll just let him introduce himself. Oh, you! Of course it's you! It simply couldn't have been anyone else, could it? 
That depends. What year is it? No, wait, don't say it. There's already enough temporal instability going on in this place. My name is Thaddeus Cosma, and I am a member of... You know what? That's not important right now. This device, however, is... Too complicated to explain. See that scroll on the ledge there? It's a list of components I need you and your friends to track down. Unless I fix this device, the temporal and spatial distortions will tear this place apart, along with all of us. Thaddeus will go on to explain that the reason for all the strange teleporting creatures is due to a malfunctioning Dwemer mechanism that's created a ripple between space and time. He refuses to actually explain who he is or who he's working for, but insists that he can fix this. If we provide him with the necessary parts. Nonetheless, the clear implication is that Thaddeus Cosma is a time traveler of some kind, sent to remedy this situation before it gets any more out of hand. The fact that he's unaware of the year, yet is somehow already familiar with the vestige, seemed to reinforce this notion. Long story short, we eventually do get the man the parts he needs, and the malfunctioning dwarven device is restored, closing the time ripple. We'll then be given the opportunity to ask Thaddeus who the heck he is, to which he'll explain that he can't explain as the space-time continuum is already fragile enough before he thanks us for our help and just disappears before our eyes. Ha <laughs> ha You've done it! Brilliant! You did it! I'm incredibly grateful. You can't possibly imagine how uncomfortable it is to be in the wrong temporal configuration. Imagine bowel cramps, except all throughout your body. Absolutely horrid. It will be a few moments before everything reconfigures itself. They should realign to your time as I depart for my own. So, if you have any questions, now would be the time. <laughs> Ah, yes. We're the ones who ask questions. You provide the answers, usually in the most destructive manner possible. <laughs> I'm afraid I can't be more specific. The fragility of your brain and your understanding of space and time are rattled enough as is. Terribly sorry, I must go! <laughs> Home at last! Are we back? What in AM's name happened? Now, time travel in and of itself isn't exactly a foreign concept in the Elder Scrolls universe. I mean, it's really at the heart of Skyrim's story, what with Alduin's time leap and everything. However, such a casual use of the phenomenon by a human certainly raises some eyebrows. So, where slash when does this Thaddeus man come from? Who is he working with? And why is he so familiar with the player character? Well, I suppose only Thaddeus knows, and Thaddeus won't tell. Moving on, but running with our theme of Skyrim mysteries that aren't necessarily about the Elder Scrolls V, what were the Ice Tribes? So, in 2004, shortly after the release of Morrowind, Bethesda, alongside many other developers of the era, attempted to break into the mobile games market, and with the help of some subcontractors, released the Elder Scrolls Travels Dawnstar. Now, mind you, this was a 2004 mobile game, so as you can imagine, it was a very trimmed down and primitive experience compared to what we've grown accustomed to in the present day. Nonetheless, the plot of this game was very interesting. You see, as its name implies, the title was set in the city of Dawnstar on Skyrim's northern coast sometime in the Third Era during Imperial rule. The defining event of the game was the sudden arrival of a mysterious and very hostile group of invaders 
known simply as the Ice Tribes, who sought to wreak havoc upon the vulnerable city. The warriors of the Ice Tribes were blue-skinned and somewhat humanoid in their appearance, though they were accompanied by all sorts of alien creatures which aided them in their attacks. Notably, the final boss of this mobile game was this weird monster-looking thing called the Gehenoth. Ultimately, we the player would succeed in saving the town and driving back the tribes by slaying their chieftain and that Gehenoth thing. Though the origins and nature of the Ice Tribes would never be explained, all we have to go off of is that they're blue people who seem to have come from the north. As you might imagine, the identity of these invaders remains a subject of intense speculation within the community. Many players identify the Ice Tribes with the Fulmer, while others have suggested that they could be related to the Reichlings, or even some lost society from Atmora. I, personally, however, like the idea that they could be from Akavir. You see, of the few peoples we know to be inhabiting that foreign continent, there is supposedly a strange northern race called the Kamal, which are described as snow demons, and have been known to invade Tamriel by sea in the past already. As a matter of fact, in the Second Era, just prior to the events of the Elder Scrolls Online, the Kamal supposedly landed a massive army at the gates of Windhelm, and took over much of Skyrim before eventually being driven back. Conveniently though, despite their well-documented invasion, we have virtually no idea what the Kamal actually looked like, or how their society was organized. Furthermore, the Ice Tribes being related to them could explain their access to such strange and alien creatures. So, for now, this remains my headcanon. Of course, we should also consider the reality that Elder Scrolls lore was considerably less developed in 2004 than it is today, and much of the game was outsourced to a mobile studio after all. So, these blue-skinned seaborne invaders may just be little more than a red herring. Or, maybe not. Coming in at number 8, Missing God refers to a mysterious, seemingly sinister deity whose temple and altar we can encounter within the game, but whose exact nature remains unelaborated upon. Within the province of Winterhold, nearby a cave called the Sightless Pit, the player can stumble upon a strange set of ancient ruins. A large altar, which appears to be of Dwemer make, overlooks a gorgeous cliffside. Around the structure will be various bone piles, and a full skeleton rests atop the altar itself, alongside some random leveled loot, and a copy of the Conjuration skill book, Doors to Oblivion. While the whole site is initially quite tranquil, interacting with any item here will cause the skeleton and bone piles to suddenly animate and attack the player. While the ensuing battle is hardly a struggle, there's good reason to suspect that there's more to this place than meets the eye. You see, according to the Creation Kit and the official Skyrim game guide, this location is known as the Altar of Zrib. Who's Zrib? Well, at first, I had just assumed that Zrib was the dude on the altar, or the name of the necromancer that set this whole thing up or whatever. But further inspection reveals that it's something more significant. As mentioned, this altar is right next to a giant hole in the ground, appropriately named the Sightless Pit, which we can just trust fall our way into. The pit initially starts off as a somewhat normal ice cave, where we'll have to fight our way through insects and wolves, However, as we descend deeper and deeper, the location will slowly transform into a massive Dwemer ruin overrun with Falmer, and we'll eventually find ourselves standing before the doors to the Temple 
of Zrib. It's a large Dwemer hull, inhabited by a few Falmer and their Charis minions, whom we'll have to fight our way through to access an elevator, which will lift us back up to ground level. The temple itself would be a rather innocuous structure, if not for its unique name. It seems to consist of a large auditorium and a stage of sorts, where a chest containing some more random leveled loot sits before a Dwemer chandelier and some Falmer totems. Nonetheless, the question this place and the altar we saw earlier clearly beckon is who is Zrib? There is literally no other mention of such an entity's name in Skyrim, or any of the other Elder Scrolls games for that matter. There's nothing to go off of. The most common explanation that I see proposed within the community is that Zrib is the manifestation of some mysterious god worshipped by the Falmer, which, you know, makes sense. The Dawnguard DLC reveals that the Snow Elves once worshipped something resembling the typical Aldmeri pantheon, with all the normal elven gods. But it stands to reason that with their physical transformation, their religion could have taken some twisted turns as well. We see at several Falmer sites evidence of human sacrifice and other bizarre rituals. So this is a perfectly solid theory. The other, perhaps more interesting possibility though, is that Zrib was a deity being explicitly worshipped by the Dwemer, or a faction of Dwemer, themselves back in their heyday. This is generally seen as less likely, as most of our sources refer to the dwarves as not really being big on the whole religion thing. They are said to have recognized the existence of the Divines and the Daedra, but preferred to see themselves as equal to them and beneath such pathetic groveling. That said, there is some evidence that the Deep Folk were more pious than they let on. ESO features several Dwemer temples, though the exact pantheon being celebrated is never made clear. And furthermore, here's the real sus part, the opening paragraph of the book Nerevar and the Red Mountain, a book about the Battle of the Red Mountain, written by the Tribunal, says the following, quote, Resdane, present-day Morrowind was contested ground between two very different types of Mur. The Chimer, who worshipped Daedra, and the Dwemer, who worshipped a profane and secret power. End quote. A profane and secret power? Hmm. This could be an allusion to the heart of Lorcan or some more terrestrial force that isn't mentioned, but this perhaps leaves open the possibility for something more frightening. Whatever the case, the nature of this Zrib fellow remains a mystery for the ages. Perhaps a future video is due on the Dwemer and Falmer faiths. Coming in at number 9, we have the suspicious circumstances surrounding Pride Home. So this all ties back to our section on Jurgen Windcaller earlier in the video, and I suppose by extension also to that Greybeard card. Back in 2019, nearly four years ago, the Elder Scrolls Online received a major new expansion called Dragonhold, which sent players to the region of Southern Elsewhere and had a strangely familiar main story. You see, Dragonhold's main questline revolved around the return of dragons to Elsewhere, and the player would have to team up with a group of Khajiiti monks known as the Pride of Alkosh, who lived on a monastic estate in the mountains called Pride Home to defeat them. That's not the end of it, though. In order to defeat this new dragon threat, which apparently was a group that splintered off from Alduin's long ago, the player would need to recover the horn of Pride Home's builder and their priestly order's founder, an ancient Khajiiti hero named Jadari. Like Jurgen Windcaller, Jadari was once a great warrior, who following a series of defeats in battle, 
developed a more pacifist philosophy before founding a new monastic order which we engage with in the present day. We encounter Jadari's spirit a couple of times during the events of the story, though sadly her dialogue is limited, and not too much is revealed. Notably, however, we do learn that Jadari's name in the dragon tongue was Tosh Rakat. This is especially interesting because in the book Mysterious Akavir, an anonymously written Tetris on the nature of Nern's other great continent, there is mention of a tiger dragon god named Tosh Raka, get it, Tosh Rakat, who supposedly leads the cat folk of Akavir. There's no way such similar names are a coincidence, and the parallels to Jurgen Windcaller are equally suspect here. Alas, the meaning behind all these mysterious similarities isn't obvious. The way history seems to be repeating itself between High Hrothgar and Pridehome suggests some deep metaphysical and esoteric shenanigans are afoot, and one of the books introduced by Dragonhold, called Pride Home, a place outside of time, further hints at some divine metaphysics beyond our understanding. Take a listen to the first couple of paragraphs. It opens up with the following disclaimer. Quote, Transcribers note, This transcription uses verbs that, in our language, denote the passage of time. I feel like they hamper understanding, of what this itinerant Khajiit moon priest tried to explain to me. But I need to get these concepts down, albeit roughly, before my own mind confuses me even more. As a result, any mistakes in this transcription are my own. I only wish to give you a sense of the timelessness that the moon priests provided to me. But perhaps that way opens a path to the likes of Shia Gorath. Also, please note that the Moon Priest refused to provide his name, stating that he was both a priest with knowledge and a neophyte with no knowledge at all, all at once. Now the text formally begins, quote, Before time and the tapestry, Pride Home existed. As an ideal, it has always existed, it always will exist. The Dragon God of Time, Alkosh, wove it into the tapestry and time, making it real for the rest of us with our limited perception of linear time. Pride Home served as a home for the adepts who follow the teachings of the God of Time, a secluded place, a place where they prepared for the doom to come, a time when dragons return and bring unbalance to the world. Champion Jadari heard the call of Alkosh and crafted Pride Home, making it real for the rest of us. Yes, she fought the Black Beast. Yes, she died even as she succeeded. Yet she succeeded only for a time, in your mind. But yes, she has always existed and succeeded. She always will exist. I think you get the idea. The point that this book is making is that Pride Home is more than just a physical structure. It's more than just a monastery that was built some time ago. It is a divine location with a special place in metaphysics. And I think a similar argument could also be made for High Hrothgar. We know the Throat of the World occupies a very special place in Nord folklore. It's said to be where mankind was born, in a sense, when kind breathed life into man. And despite our legends claiming it was all built by Jürgen Windcaller in the First Era, if you remember earlier in the iceberg, there are all these mysterious ancient languages around it that seem way older than that. There's something mysterious going on there, too. I could go on and on about the metaphysical significance of the Pride Home Monastery, and I think a future video on this subject is absolutely due. But for now, you get the idea. The Greybeards have some creepy Khajiiti cousins. And finally, our last mystery of Tier 5 concerns the curious case of Uriel Septim V, Tamriel's Lost Emperor. 
So, Uriel Septim V, not to be confused with Uriel VII, was crowned Emperor of the Septim Dynasty in the year 268 of the Third Era, roughly 365 years prior to the events of Skyrim. Inheriting the throne peacefully from his father, Sepphoris, the early days of Uriel's reign were marked by stability and plenty. He ran the empire well enough and avoided falling into the pits of corruption and decadence that had plagued many of his predecessors. However, Uriel was not content to simply preside over another boring era of calm prosperity. No, he was a man of ambition and wanted to leave his mark on the world and could think of no better way to do so than by conquering Akavir, the mysterious continent across the Eastern Seas. The Emperor spent years planning this great endeavor, building the largest fleet Tamriel and possibly the whole world had ever seen, and amassing tens of thousands of troops, sailors, and builders. According to the book, Disaster at Ioneth, several members of the Imperial Court were skeptical about the operation and voiced concerns. This is ridiculous. We don't know anything about Akavir. We don't even know where exactly it is or what it looks like, they argued. But alas, their warnings were left unheeded. Beginning in the mid-270s, Uriel's Grand Expedition began making its way across the ocean, slowly conquering a number of island kingdoms along the way, until finally landing on the mainland in 288. Reports suggest the Emperor and his Grand Expedition were in the territory of the Sayesi upon landing. The Sayesi are a bizarre race of snake men, who had apparently developed something resembling a civilization before Uriel's arrival. At first, everything apparently went according to plan. The legions besieged and captured a number of coastal cities, and eventually began making their way inland. However, soon their fortunes started to turn. Winter set in, and the reserves of grain ran dry. A series of unexpected monsoons destroyed relief forces at sea and cut off Uriel's supply chains. Soon, a massive army of Sayesi defenders began to mass outside of Uriel's position behind the walls of a fort named Ioneth. With little hope of reinforcements and dwindling supplies, the Emperor decided to sally out beyond the gates with his men and go down in a blaze of glory. Only a handful of Imperial troops survived and made it back to Tamriel to tell the tale. Notably, though, no one claims to have actually seen the Emperor fall in combat. It's just assumed that he fell with his men. Nonetheless, back home, with Uriel absent, a succession crisis ensued, and the great stability he and his predecessors had worked so hard to build finally came crashing down on Uriel V's successors. However, there are many folks within the community who believe Uriel V never actually died, that he somehow survived this whole misadventure and lived to father children. Children who would be technically legitimate carriers of the Septim bloodline, and therefore rightful claimants to the Imperial Throne in the Fourth Era. While this has always been a rather niche theory, given that the only evidence we have is the fact that Uriel's death was unwitnessed, in 2019, Todd Howard actually sort of confirmed that Bethesda was entertaining it when a fan asked a question about the nature of Akavir, Todd Howard responded by saying the following, quote, What is beyond the ocean? Would you do a game in Akavir? These are things we at Bethesda have all thought about. Actually, one of the original Skyrim designs had, I think it was Uriel V returning with his army of dragons to retake the throne." End quote. So, while Bethesda clearly ended up taking Skyrim's story in a different direction, they have seriously entertained the idea of a legitimate Imperial descendant of Uriel returning for a while now. 
it's likely this was their plan when they were developing Oblivion. Perhaps this storyline could later play a role in a future game. Maybe the way out of this whole mess the Empire is in, where an illegitimate Mede Emperor tries to wrestle with the Thalmor and internal rebellions, is for our boy Uriel and his descendants to reclaim their birthright. But with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have finally done it. We have concluded our Skyrim Mysteries Iceberg. Five tiers, four episodes, and four hours in total. Citizens of the internet, thank you so much, especially if you stuck with us throughout every single episode. I know it's a tremendous amount of content, and your support does wonders for the YouTube algorithm. Just, just the watch time totals alone are insanely helpful. In the future, though I'm not sure whether immediate or distant, you can expect a similar iceberg coming out for Fallout 4. Though, I'm in, I have this really great problem where there's so many video ideas that I'm not sure which one will come next, so I don't know how far along that Fallout iceberg will be. Our next video, I think, is gonna be a really long deep dive into the Children of Adam that I'm super thrilled about. I, there's a, a tremendous amount of work has already been put into that, but uh, that's all oh, hush hush. More on that later. Anyway, guys, again, thanks so much for stopping by, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.